Let me continue. Um, whenever you go to church, there are always four agendas which intersect with each other. Now, the agenda that you will be most aware of is your own personal agenda. What do I want this Sunday? Or what don't I want? Very often, and it's strange, very often we come to the divine service with a negative agenda. You know, just let me be, don't mess with me. So what do I want? What don't I want? That's the first agenda. We are most aware of this. And this is what causes um, uh, uh, most of our reactions and judgments. The second agenda is the agenda of the church. Um, what we need, not what we want, but what we need as Christians. That's the whole reason why we have a liturgy, an order, is not to give people what they want, but what the scriptures, what uh, uh, the church says we need. Um, the third agenda is the agenda of the pastor or pastors. Um, what we need not as Christians but what we need as in this congregation. Now if we stopped here, do you see what the problem is? No God. No God. It's, it, well, it's hard to see where, where the voice of God is, here or here or here. There is God input, but we can't see what's the input from God or not. That's number one. There is another problem, and that's very important. That's foundational. This is we, we. What's the problem? Where is God's interaction with me? Yes, and, and at, at this time and this place and at this stage in our life. Now, what is decisive for me is what do I need at this time and at this place in my life? The Spirit's agenda. Now, I want to talk about how do we discover the Spirit's agenda for us in the in the interplay between those three factors. Um, now, uh, most obviously, it will be by the impact of the service on us. And it's either both positive and negative. And I'd urge you to be discerning in this and to look at this for yourself. First of all, this coming Sunday, as part of and I'm going to debrief you at the beginning of next period, take notice of the things that affect you negatively as you go to church this Sunday. Um, now, typically, uh, this is the kind of bag, the things that I get used to almost every Sunday. There's always something there that makes me go into critical mode, something that I think is wrong. <laughs> very significant for me because very often the things that I'm most critical of in others reveals something about myself and it's not always obvious. Have you always noticed you see your own faults most clearly in others? Okay, so that critical attitude is very important if you want to know what's hap going on in your soul. Secondly, um, the things that irritate me, that make me angry, if something makes me angry, it shows that I'm being touched at some point. And the thing that makes, it's not the anger significant, but the thing that makes me angry is significant in some way. Um, uh, the next two are so obvious that you're aware of. If I feel guilty about something, a sense of guilt or a sense of shame, that's going to be revealing and significant. What is it that makes me feel ashamed? What is it that makes me feel guilty and why? Um, uh, that's what happens when you come into the light. Um, uh, uh, taking note of the things that get up your nose. Um, the thing, th those words of God, those things that you uh, go against the grain, any aversion to the word of God, okay? 
I like hearing this, but I don't like that, that negative reaction to some aspect of the Word of God. And I'm not just talking about the sermon, it can come in prayers, it can come in songs, wherever it is. Um, aversion to the Word of God. But notice particularly two things that are very important, a sense of tiredness. Have you ever gone to church? You feel all right, but as soon as you sit down, then what happens? You're overwhelmed with tiredness. Do you realize that that's one of the most significant things that could happen to you spiritually? Worship is meant to give you rest in order to be refreshed. So that tiredness is significant. What is it signaling to you? Negatively, I've been too busy and I've been trying to cope by myself, run off my own steam. But what is God saying to me if all of a sudden when I come into his presence, I feel tired? That he wants to give me a time of rest. Forget about all the rest. It's just time out. Not just psychological, physical rest, but spiritual rest. Um, uh, yeah, oh, I, that, em, tiredness most of all, but then also a sense of emptiness. Instead of feeling spiritually full, you feel spiritually empty. That's very significant. Why? Do you come as full people to bring the fullness of the Spirit in worship? What do you come? You come to receive. And that sense of emptiness shows that basically you've got to go in what mode? You've, there's something there that you need to receive, to be filled. Um, and it may come from unexpected quarters. Now, I've just taken a few obvious things there. So, this coming Sunday, take notice of what I call the negative impacts. Most people would not take this as being terribly spiritual, but rather psychological. Let me tell you, this is all spiritual stuff and reveals spiritual stuff. On the other hand, take notice of those things that have a positive uh, effect on you, things that have an impact on you, and not just the sermon, but any words that are spoken, any song, any prayer. Um, usually in any service there's something that engages me, that has impact on me. Now if it has impact on me, it means that that spirit, the Holy Spirit, is engaging me at that point and is preaching to me and applying something to me personally. Take notice of that because it's the thing that you need to look on, meditate on, reflect on, receive as a gift from God. Um, uh, if you have a sense of uh, uh, assurance of salvation, a good conscience, you come and you say, yeah, I know I'm saved, I know God is pleased with me. You know, that positive sense, very important. Um, a sense of joy, delight, encouragement, but most of all, guidance. Um, guidance, most of all, expect the kind of guidance you need to, to, to be most aware of is wherever the Spirit is guiding you to pray. Every Sunday, the Holy Spirit will be working at you not just to expose the darkness, but to get you to pray for the things that you need or somebody else needs. So be open to the Spirit's guidance in prayer or in your work or in your relationships. Um, and I don't mean that negatively, I mean that positively. If I, when I go to church, think, oh, look, I should give my sister a phone call now, it's a long time since I've been in touch with her. Okay, that's very important that I follow th those kinds of things up. So, take note of what happens for you this coming Sunday. And I want each of you to tell me one of the, th uh, 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 the most outstanding or impressive negative thing as well as positive thing for you in the service and why it was negative and why it was positive. Just to get you uh, looking at what happens to you. No, this is not objective analysis of the service. I want you to look at it the way the service impacts on you personally. Sometimes hard to separate those two. It's absolutely. Say you have a song, dodgy theology. That's right. It kicks you off on an objective uh, level, but then it's hard. Sometimes it doesn't. Maybe you know, personal 
in your conscience. It doesn't do anything. It just washes over. Yes. Um, but but some of it, it's hard to tell though how much it annoys you on what level. Or okay. It's really funny. It's all my favourite songs as well. It's the theology of it is just rubbish. Cra yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's yes. my favourite place of worship song at the moment. Huh? Yeah. And take notice of that. Yeah. You know. Um, uh, you, this is, you, you need to do this in order to um, uh, have discernment. It's, this is not easy to do all this stuff. To distinguish what's psychological and personal from what's spiritual, the two always come confused. Now, what's the basic issue that's involved here? Well, Luther puts it quite graphically. He says, in any service there's always two sermons that are occurring. There's the sermon of the pastor, and then there's a sermon of the Holy Spirit. At some points they will coincide, but at other points they will diverge. Now I first discovered this when I was a young pastor, and uh, you know I preached a sermon, and I was quite happy with the sermon as my sermons went, and then at the end of the service, um, somebody came and thanked me for saying something. And you know what? I was sure I hadn't, hadn't said it. I hadn't said it. I asked Claire, did I say that? She says, oh, look, I had the kids here. I wasn't really listening. <laughs> <laughs> and it was you in any case. I, oh, you open your mouth. I, that's me, not her. I switch off. It still happens these days. Dr. Does it? Ah, uh, OK. I do the same to her. So it's, uh, uh, we're even Stevens. Um, now. Uh, this happened once, and, and then it happened again, and again, and then I went even to the extent of uh, quite deliberately taping a sermon, a number of series of sermons, because it worried me. You know, what is it? The fact that I, you know, prepare the sermon, and then when I get up, I say something else, and I don't realise what I'm saying. You know, that's a bit worrying. Um, so I taped the sermon, and uh, then sure enough, somebody thanked me for it something, and I went listened to the sermon, I hadn't said it. And then the penny dropped. I realised what? If you preach the Word of God, the Spirit is at work there. And um, if what you say is relevant to that person, the Spirit will apply it to that person's life. But if what you say is not relevant, what's the Holy Spirit going to do? is to take that and connect it with some other word of God, which is in the memory of that person, and preach that word to that person in order to minister to that person. Just take notice of that. Um, uh, there is always, uh, I don't know whether you've noticed, when you listen to a sermon or church, there are times when you're switched in, concentrating, and there's times when you drift off, and then you come back in. Which do you think is the most important part of your experience of a sermon? The tuning, the tuning out, the drifting part, because that shows where the Spirit is taking over and preaching to you. Now take notice of that, because wherever that happens, something significant is going on in you. Um, uh, how does this work? Well, um, uh, if there's one place that you can expect the Spirit to be at work, if there's one place where you can expect the Spirit's guidance, it's where? In church. The church is the workshop of the Holy Spirit. It's the creation of the Holy Spirit. It's the place where you can be sure that any spiritual stuff is not from the evil spirit or from human spirits, but it's God's Spirit. There's some other stuff that impinges, particularly if it's not right, if it's dodgy stuff. But if it's not dodgy, you can expect then the Holy Spirit is going to be at work. And that means that if you're going to receive spiritual guidance at one place, and you can be sure that it's the Holy Spirit, it's in the divine service. If there's any place on earth we receive it, it's there. Because what happens then in uh, the worship is that the Holy Spirit takes the Word of God and connects it with my experience and goes the other way, connects my experience with the Word. So the Spirit works through the Word 
applying that word to my experience and bringing my experience to bear on the word of God so that they mutually interpret and interact with each other. Um, the Holy Spirit applies the word of God to us personally. He preaches Christ to, not just to our ears, but into our hearts and into our lives. One of the most helpful uh, pieces of spiritual um, guidance, I suppose you'd call it, direction I ever received happened here at the seminary when I was a second year student. And I still remember graphically, um, it happened out there halfway between Haybart Hall and the library. I could almost tell you exact pace exactly where it was because it was, so, it's been, it was such a significant point in my life. Um, when I came to seminary, I'd been four years at university, um, um, I decided that, you know, okay, finally I was going to turn over a new leaf and I was going to be serious about two areas. One is my devotional life and the other thing was um, worship. Now, I was really going to turn over a new leaf and get those two in order. Um, and you know what happened? Um, it used to happen most of all whenever I went to church. Even if I went to a church where the service was good, there was a good sermon, I'd sit there and I'd be distracted. In the middle of a prayer, boom, this way, um, the sermon. You know, you'd start off following it and I'd be listening and then without knowing it, I'd go off on a drift, a daydream. And I'd lose one or two minutes of what was spoken. And then I'd come back in. I'd concentrate bringing it back. It was the problem of distraction. Now, nobody taught me much anything about this and I'd assumed in my spiritual naivety that these distractions which came to me in worship but also in my devotional life had come from the devil. What the devil was doing was trying to stop me listening to God, focusing on God, receiving the gifts of God. That was my theory. That's the way I experienced it. And I still remember it. Sasa was there after a lecture. He raced out before us. He had a great big pile of books. He always carried piles of books into lectures. He never opened them. He knew it all off by heart. He'd just have them there just in case. So he was going over there and uh, uh, I said, uh, Dr. Sasa, um, um, do you have a moment? And he said, yes. Um, very abrupt, and I said, uh, 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 yes, what do you want, Kleinig? Uh, and I said, I, 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 look, Dr. Zasser, I've got a spiritual problem. And Zasser stopped walking, and he faced me, he lifted his finger, he says, good. <laughs> Somebody telling you that's good that you had a spiritual problem. When I recovered, <laughs> from the assault of that good uh, 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 then he said uh, yeah and then he went on I, I didn't know where to go he says what's your problem and I said look uh, whenever I try to pray whenever I listen to a sermon I get distracted by the devil and he looked me straight in the eye and he said who said it's from the devil Perhaps it is the Holy Spirit. Went on. Do you realize that that is the best spiritual direction I've ever received in my life? Perhaps it is the Holy Spirit. I learnt more in practical terms from that, not just in this area, not just in prayer and worship, but the whole of my life, from that little remark than any other single bit of advice I've ever received. How about that for exaggerated claim? <laughs> uh, my, yeah. my first pastor, very strong teaching on that, he always taught people that in the sermon or the prayers, you're being let off the disclosure. Yes, was that Ted? Yes, yes, I recognize that. Guess where he got it from, I think. It's probably, he was a student of Sasa. He was a student of the Holy Spirit, yes, 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 yes. Same thing. <laughs> uh, okay, perhaps it is the Holy Spirit. Now, um, uh, what I'd like you to be aware of is these um, uh, distractions. Now, it may be 
I thought about it and I said, some of the stuff was, I, 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 it, I really, it, uh, that night I basically just kept on getting back to this and trying to work out what he said, because he was the kind of person who'd put these riddles and he'd never explain it. You had to work it out yourself. Um, trying to work it out. And there was some stuff that didn't make sense. You know, I could make sense of some of the things that happened, but what about this kind of thing? You know, I was uh, not married then, young bloke. Um, and, you know, there was this good-looking chick that was sitting in front of me, and then I was listening, I'd look at her and say, oh, she's pretty good, uh, she's nice-looking. Uh, okay, is that from the Holy Spirit? Appreciating God's creative... <laughs> <laughs> Number one, it could be. Yeah, no. Um, and uh, don't be... Don't... don't uh, I think that that's just a joke. It's real. I had a um, pastor who met his, his wife for the first time by doing that at a communion rail, looking yes. at the rail, and oh, she looks all right. She looks all right. Uh, definitely guidance of the spirit there. Uh, but it, look, even if it is of Satan, if you take it as from the Holy Spirit, then the, what's the spirit going to tell me? One of two things, either to thank God for her and for the gift of beauty. And just for her, and that she's nice looking. It's a gift of God. Uh, not that I've got to own it, but I thank God for it. And that stops anything sexual going that way. And the other thing is maybe God has called my attention to her to pray for her. And I've taken that now. When this kind of thing happens, those kind of what look like distractions, if you take them as guidance for prayer, then even if they come from the evil spirit, what do you do? You, 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 you subvert them. You turn them into the work of the Spirit. Right? Um, get the Holy Spirit in and good comes out of it. Yes, now somebody had... Julie, did you? Oh, no, no. Uh, the other Martin. Yes. yes. I was just going to say, um, what you're saying to send me a struck with me, especially in the context of counselling people with sexual problems. Yes. That when they get to the point of um, discussing, if it's a male discussing females, and yes. they, they tend to disassociate the fact that women were made to be beautiful. Yes. Um, and so they only ever see it as a negative. Yes. And that's a really good example of yeah. no God did make women as something to be easy on the eyes, something to be beautiful. Yes, yes. And the same with guys too. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, it does, I don't understand that. That's beyond me. Uh, yeah, like, yeah. So just to be aware of, I guess it, it goes with all things, but you know, there is this line definitely where God has created things to be beautiful and just listen to this in that light and um, uh, we live in a society where all sorts of sexual stuff is pushed at us and one of the most difficult areas of counselling that you're going to gonna have to face is people with sexual issues uh, not just pornography, other issues with sexuality just listen to what Paul says just before that passage in Ephesians that I looked at he says among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality. Now, that's a euphemism for uh, pornaya, which means fornication. Or of any kind of impurity. The impurity he's talking about here is sexual impurity. <coughs> or of greed. What kind of greed? Lost. Sexual greed. Right? There's three things. Pornaya, fornication impurity and sexual greed because they are improper for God's holy people. And he says, nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk or coarse joking. What kind of foolish talk, coarse joking do you think he's talking about? Sexual, sexual stuff. Okay? This is clearly sexual. Um, it's a bit euphemistic because you don't talk about these things directly in the ancient world. But notice the next thing. Um, in, don't let any uh, obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which is out of place, um, should there be, but rather thanksgiving. That's your point. Uh, instead of uh, focusing on the bad side of it, one of the simplest ways of dealing with sexual problems is through thanksgiving. Thanksgiving no, say so you're a married man, I'm a married man, in thanking God for the beauty of other women, if I'm attracted to them. But also thanking God for my wife, not thinking of my own sexual inadequacy or the fact that she doesn't deliver to me what I want, 
but thanking God for her beauty. And no, quite frankly and openly, sexual beauty. No, that she's good looking. Yeah. That she turns me on, uh, etc. Thanking God for that. Now, as soon as you have thanksgiving, what do you do then? Whether it's your own wife or whether it's other women, whether it's your own husband or other men. In the area of sex, you get the devil out of it. Thanksgiving puts everything in its proper place. Uh, and I've found that in dealing with one of the hardest things is to, get, to deal with that I've had to face in my ministry. Not the hardest, but a hard thing is people who are addicted to pornography. Now, you don't drive out darkness with darkness. Um, you, you can't just make a vacuum. But if somebody has this problem of pornography in their heart and mind, you've got to put something positive in its place. So instead of the bad sexual stuff, what do you need to put in? Thanksgiving focus, imagination on the good stuff, the right stuff, the holy stuff, um, the kind of stuff that the Song of Songs rejoices in, no, which is just enjoying it as a good gift of God, as something nice and beautiful and enjoyable, um, not disgusting or bad or evil. I don't Thanksgiving, that's, that's a key to a lot of this area. Uh, yeah, how do we get, oh yes, this drift, yes. Thank you for that, because that's quite helpful. And by the way, uh, you'll need to, all of you will need to uh, be uh, you know, aware of this stuff in your own life if you're going to help other people. Uh, and this is going to be one of the challenges in your spiritual direction of others, is helping them to appreciate sexuality. Because in our society, we oscillate between two extremes. Either we are... Uh, overvalue sexuality and make an idol of it, idolatry, Paul talks about sexual idolatry, or what's the other extreme? We idolize it, we expect it to solve all our problems, it's the big... What? It's even stronger that we then we re react it by trying to ignore it and then what do we become? Then we become disgusted at it. I don't know whether you realize how much sexual disgust is riddles our society. A lot of the sexual kind of talk, the coarse language that we use, shows our, what we actually feel about it. Um, uh, sexual disgust is very, very powerful. And people oscillate between idolatry and disgust. Um, and quite often then what it leads then is to, is, is a kind of, they become sexually neutered. You know, you no longer can respond sexually and you've got to go to all sorts of extremes. However, that's enough of this. This is not uh, sexually counselling. Um, okay, anything else just on this issue before I move on? I hope it's helpful to you, yes? Well, there's, there's a lack of distraction then you just enjoy distraction, then you just enjoy this, this part. Um, right? There's two things, okay? Uh, I'm talking, there's the negative stuff, there's the positive stuff, and then there's the distractions. Right? Can you see there's three different issues? Now, between those three, you can discover what the Spirit's agenda for you is at this time, this place in your life, I would maintain. Right? Uh, where am I? Yes, this. So, um, let's just uh, uh, go through a few things here. Um, Okay, there's this drift during the sermon, you know, and it, sometimes it comes, you know, the pastor's preaching a sermon, and you get a Bible verse that pops in your mind, and you say, oh, he should have referred, cross-referred to this passage. Uh, he should have. He probably did his exegesis. He probably did, and he deliberately left it out so that the Holy Spirit would have some room to <laughs> apply it, uh, or some insight. Now, I don't know if you have the same thing with me, and, and it's maybe because I'm a theologian, but I listen to the sermon and then I have all sorts, it triggers all sorts of other insights, and I think, oh, if only he'd said that. The problem is I'm taking it as being, that insight as being applied to what the devil would want me to do, is apply it to other people, whereas what the Spirit wants to do is to apply it to me and to receive it as God's word to me. Um, uh, 
okay, there's, there's quite obvious things. Now, let's say in the middle of church, you remember something good that happened last week. Why do you think the Holy Spirit wants to remind you of the fact that you had a good experience last week? So you can give thanks for it. So you can give thanks for it. Um, why is it that you have a memory of a person? So you, can pray for them. so you can pray for them. Okay, Maria, take these things through for me. Why is it that you all of a sudden maybe uh, start worrying about a person or problems at work? Because God wants to show you that you bring them before to him in prayer so that you pray for them. Fantastic, because usually the thing is we think we've got to fix it up by ourselves. And God's saying, no, 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 it's not your, it's not your business. Just handball it over to me. Uh, tiredness I've spoken about, guilt about failure, inadequacy, all that's fairly obvious. Can you see that? Uh, the Spirit is at work guiding us, um, noting the agenda. Um, so sometimes this is obvious, sometimes it's less than obvious. Uh, what's the purpose of these uh, three things. Remember, there's uh, number one, there's the negative reactions. Number two, the positive reactions. Number three, the distractions. There's those three areas. Well, in this way, the Spirit takes the Word and uses the Word of God to minister to us personally. And the problem is, unless we receive it, we frustrate the work of the Spirit in us we go against God's agenda for us and in most cases we fail to receive the gift that God wants to give to us. Can you imagine how much it hurts God when he wants to give all this stuff to us and what do we do? Don't, don't, take, it. don't take it. Or we just take it in a very superficial way instead of welcoming it and focusing on it, meditating it, assimilating it, enjoying it fully. Right? There's lots of stuff that God wants to give us in a very short space of time. Just think, you have a whole week behind you this coming Sunday, there's tons of stuff that God wants to do for you for the next week, and it's all got to fit in the slot of one hour at church. Um, okay? uh, we need to be aware of how much is likely to happen spiritually here. Uh, secondly, uh, God doesn't want us to separate worship from life and wor life from worship. He wants to bring the two together uh, so that uh, our life is connected with our worship and our worship is interconnected with life. That's where you get uh, spiritual growth, uh, most obviously. Thirdly, and I'd like to emphasize this, the more you become sensitized to the Spirit's guidance, for example, these cases here, uh, the more you will experience the Spirit's guidance. Now, I don't know whether you've had this experience. All of a sudden, out of the blue, you remember somebody that you'd forgotten. Have any of you had that happen? Okay. Now, okay, I can say, oh, that's very odd. I, I haven't thought about that. Why did I think about that? Now, if I take that as guidance of the Spirit and use it then to do what? pray, and then if I pray and something else is given to me, maybe I need to do something else, I follow it through, guess what's going to happen? What's the Spirit going to do? He will, instead of doing it occasionally, and since I don't do it, well, he says, okay, he's a hopeless case, uh, there's not much use, I'll have to use a rule three by four to get him to do what I want uh, uh, him to do. Uh, he will do it more and more. The more you're sensitive to the Spirit's guidance, who leads you this way and that way, how about doing this, uh, pray for this person, uh, you know, that kind of thing, the more you're going to experience it in your daily life. Uh, and it's by following it that you in fact become more and more sensitised to the guidance and operation of the Spirit in your life. Yes? Yeah, it just, in my experience it's not that the Spirit then tells me more. No. He's always telling me more than I can probably yes. hear. But it's that you learn and you learn to listen um, more and so you can hear a lot more of where the Spirit's coming. It's, yes, it's not that it happens more, it's that you can take it in yeah. and receive it and enjoy it more fully. Yeah. Um, you become sensitised uh, to the working of the Spirit. One of the problems is that the Spirit's talking to us all the time. What's my problem? That I go around with fingers in my ears. Uh, or if I hear it, I just think, oh, that's just a funny thought. 
that popped into my mind, I don't realize where it's coming from, or I might realize where it's coming from, but I don't, norm don't realize what it's getting me to do. Now, I have a bottom line uh, principle that I work on. If I receive any promptings, I, I started off when I was a young Christian, and when I was a young pastor, to say, now, okay, the Spirit's given this to me. Now, uh, what it therefore means that I've got to tell somebody something, or I've got to do something out there. I've discovered that that's very dangerous, because the evil one can sabotage that if I go straight from the Spirit's guidance to saying or doing something. So my default position is, if I get some guidance, and I'm not sure what it's for. What do I assume it's for? Prayer, prayer, prayer. Can I say too, you know, there's a lot of obsession with prophecy in the church at the moment. Now, most cases of prophecy, I would venture prophecy, genuine prophecy comes out of prayer. And in most cases will do what? It's meant to lead you, to guide you into prayer. And if you go that way, then you guard yourself against sabotage from the evil one. Okay? So the default position is, if I don't know what the point of something is, um, I will take it always as a stimulus, as guidance, as direction to pray. Um, uh, what happens then in this way is that the spirit develops our... Uh, our, our, our spirituality, our personal spirituality. It's not as if we become more spiritual, but we become uh, and you know able to do things spiritually. But what the spirit does is wants to make us more and more receptive to God and the gifts of God. So um, out of this comes growing receptivity. Because I don't know whether you have the same problem that I do. I think that I can do everything by myself. Yes, I know. I can do that. I'm competent. My problem is not giving to others, speaking, doing. My problem is receiving. And the growth in your spiritual life is basically growth in receptivity uh, and the capacity to receive more and more fully the amazing cornucopia of gifts that God wants to shower upon us. Hand up somewhere. Yes, uh, Josh. I was just thinking of when Theon quoted the Quakers when we were talking about this yes. sort of stuff and, and how, in a way, I guess they've you know, picked up on this and taken it to the extreme. And yes. sort of trying to think, what is the, what's the definitive point that makes it the difference between what you're talking about and, and yeah, Quakerism? The problem with Quaker is that the work of the Spirit's divorced from uh, the Word of God. Now, um, one of the reasons for order in the church and liturgy is to create space, a framework for this to happen. Now, what ritual does, and good ritual does, is allows people to tune in, but also to tune out. Gives space for this to happen, gives an order, a framework for this to happen, means that the Word of God is spoken. And if the word of God is spoken, if the name of the triune God is named, then you can be sure that the spiritual guidance that happens there is going to come from the Holy Spirit. So uh, there is an element of truth and great value in that Quaker tradition, but the, behind Quakerism lies the Protestant separation of word and spirit. Word and spirit separated from each other. That's dangerous. Please, for Sunday, take note of what happens to you and be ready to report back.